Good afternoon, good evening, good morning maybe, depending where uh, you are in the world. We're right here, London, England, Europe at the moment. It is Europe. I don't know what this going to change or not. It's all in the air at the moment. Um, lots to tell you about to begin with. Um, as you know, this is a live show. Things kind of do go wrong. It looks like I'm flickering in and out of consciousness right now, actually. That's very strange. Anyway, um, maybe it's a spectral apparition behind me. So um, the voting, uh, you can vote up to five times now. You can't vote as much as you want to, but you can vote up to five times, and that happens, tends to happen towards the end of the show. Some parish announcements, guys. There is a Latopia huddle this Saturday. So if you're a priority member um, of Latopia, then you will get sort of a priority booking for about 24 hours. So uh, the last one was very successful. We will be opening the lines up about 4.30 so people can come along 4.30 UK time and just talk to each other for half an hour. Then it'll be uh, officially kicking off at five o'clock. And I think last time it lasted about two hours. So expect to spend about two hours in the company of your fellow writers and me. Uh, there's a new area that will be opening imminently inside Latopia called the Galeria. Um, that is pretty much as it sounds, but uh, stand by for that. The show, I'm rattling through these at the moment, the show on the 22nd of December is not happening. I've got to leave the country before then. <laughs> sounds a bit strange. I do have to leave the country before then, so we're going to be postponing that and our guests to later in uh, next year. Uh, but we will be doing something that I think you'll quite enjoy, actually, over the Christmas period. Um, we won't be having any guests, but we will be doing a complete review of the whole year and every winner of every show and that's a lot will be going head to head and we'll be, eventually we'll be producing one winner for the whole year that'll be interesting to to watch um and finally everybody knows who katie allen is uh she is our staunch booking manager here and she does huge amounts of work behind the scenes um she's got a new working commitment coming up next year and will not be able to be the booking coordinator manager um after the the beginning of the year unfortunately she will be much missed but she will make appearances on the show um so we'd like to affect some kind of handover from katie to have a it's going to be the next person which could be you if you're interested in doing it. I'm not going to trivialise the amount of work involved. It, there is quite a lot of, of work involved. It's coordinating with guests and with publishers and all kinds of people. If you fancy that sort of thing, let me know in the colony. And with that, see this? It's called a QR code. Scan it with your phone. It'll take you straight to the website we're talking about. Yes, it will. Oh, yes, it will. Um, lots of QR codes on this show, but I think... We should meet our guests. What if this is as good as it gets? I can guarantee it's going to get a lot better. Now then, we were scheduled to have another regular, Carol Rose, who's, a, who's another staunch stalwart of Latopia. Carol's sick today, unfortunately, so we send Carol our very, very best wishes. But who do I see there? Amazing speak of her, and she appears, as the French say. Speak of the wolf, and you see its tail. And this is, of course, our very own Katie. Hello, Katie. How are you? Hello, Peter. Very well, thank you. Are you flooded out up there? No, we have escaped. There's poor people in Doncaster. Oh. Yeah, yeah. It looks bad. And they've got, and they've had to put up with Boris Johnson as well. <laughs> no, no comment. <laughs> All right, you're very good. We're not political in Latopia, but we can think things, can't we? Have you brought a book for us to uh, to look at today? Uh huh. There should be a big fat book visual coming up any second. There it That's is. It. Yeah. There it is. It's a very large format book. Mm. Um, you can get it. To, it's about uh, it's nine pounds something or other. Yeah. And it's what it says on the tin. It would be great if every school could have a copy of this. Um, it's quite sophisticated inside, but it's just what you'd think, with some beautiful uh, fold-out illustrations, hmm. starting oh. with, you know, the, the age of the universe, 13.8 billion years, yeah. and then 9 billion years after that, okay. we start to get our star. That and so it, yeah. Yeah, it, pla it places us in time on the planet, yeah. and it places humanity in amongst all the other categories of life on the yeah. planet 
I love it. What a great idea. And that's that's something that yeah. books can still do really well. I think they do it yes. better than that yes. does, actually. Because, yeah. you know, just a website goes by. Well, a book is physical, it's there, and you think, oh, my goodness me. And it puts in context, doesn't it? You don't get a lot of context. Yeah. In it, in no, it's, it's beautiful with fold-out yeah. timelines and everything. Oh, so we can see that the first us's was sort of about 30 million years. Nice. But fa factoid not in the book. Leave yeah. you with a quick factoid. Please. Because I was, research I was researching scorpions the other day. Of course. For an article. <laughs> <laughs> for an article yeah and um so scorpions came so if we go back about 30 million yeah scorpions came out of the sea 350 to 450 wow million years ago wow and yeah and they're fluorescent oh, and the except and the fluorescent except when they've just molted Oh. Then they're not for us. <laughs> but, but once their new um, chitin gets nice and hard, oh, yeah. they fluoresce. Yeah, yeah. So there are fossils that are more than 350 million years old that fluoresce. Stunning. Stunning. See, I love that kind that, of information. Yeah, but then, I mean, me too. a lot of people were watching this and going, what are they talking about? But actually, I think, yeah. I think that's an indication of the writer's brain, actually. It, 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 they kind of like things, they're little jackdaws. They like lovely little shiny gobbets of, of, of knowledge. And it just goes in and who knows, 10, 20 years time, it comes out again. Thank you very much, Katie. That's terrific. Look who it is. It's Icy. All the way from uh, what, Newcastle, actually, really. Um, how nice to have you back, Icy. How are you? I'm absolutely fine. How are you? I'm chipper. <laughs> I'm all right. Yes, I, I appear to be flickering rather wildly in and out here. I would say our green screen is not well adjusted today. And it may not be the only thing that's maladjusted. Have you got a book for us? I have. Um, it is The Corset by Laura Purcell. Well, hey, I, I, li I like it already. I like it. Tell us about it. Um, it's oh, it's fantastic. It's um, that's not really selling it very well. Not it's really. Gothic no. horror. Do better. And, come on, yeah, come no, on. You can do. You can do it, better. I see. It's 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 got dual narrators, and one of them uh, is potentially a murderer, and the other one's like a, a, a middle class woman who's trying to improve the lives of women in prison, and she starts to hear the story of the potential murderer, and you never quite know has she done it, has she not. Um, mm. And then there's like a really supernatural twist in it, and it's just mm. like I did not see the end in common. Terrific, terrific. Uh, great title, great visuals. I like it. And we got two great uh, Christmas book recommendations, I think, actually. I think, I think you know, Christmas is coming. Are, are you freaked out by Christmas? I'm not even thinking about it right now. No, no, no. <laughs> it's very commercial. And, and here in London, I mean, you can't, every shop now has got the like, Christmas decorations. And you know, it's only six weeks to Christmas. Oh, no, don't make me feel anxious like that. I've got so much else to do. But actually, those two book recommendations, which will be on the website in due course, I think are terrific uh, Christmas book recommendations. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mo Hara. I'm author of My Big Fat Zombie Goldfish and Romeosaurus and Juliet Rex. Uh, I've got a writing tip for you today, and that is always start, well, in my mind, how I write, start with the character. I think if you know your main character, your protagonist, inside and out, what they have for breakfast, what they hide under their bed, all that good juicy stuff, then you will be able to write them with an authentic voice. So hot seat your character, find out everything you can about that character before you start writing about them. Okay, good luck with your writing. That was a nice tip from Mo, who is also a regular here. And uh, yeah, find out what your characters eat for breakfast. That's a, that's a nice way of approaching it, isn't it? Uh, we've got to do our, our first piece of work now. Looking forward to submissions today. Five fantastic ones, I think, I hope. This is from Jeff, and it's called The Peacemakers. And it's urban fantasy. This is Jeff's blurb. In a dystopian, not too distant future, a mind altering hallucinogenic drug may be the city's best hope. A group called the Peacemakers is giving away a new street drug called Peace to the residents of war torn terminus. To become a peacemaker, you must go through their ceremonies, experiencing death visions and communal awareness that is just the beginning ultimately you must face the powerful forces that control the fragmented city well okay that sounds right up Isis street i think let me tell you about jeff a uh, very very short one-line biography jeff says i've written a few spec scripts and self-published a couple of novels including hometown profit fair enough um, in that case i think jeff what we need to do right now is to get ali to read The Peacemakers. 
The first page. The Peacemakers by Jeff, read by Alison. Chapter one, here and now. I'm staring at my phone, waiting for a response. Nothing yet. All I want to do is go out and forget about life for a while, recapture some past glory. Not long ago, I was destined for great things. And then the kid died and it all went south. It's not like I killed him, not personally. I check my phone, still nothing. About the only time I feel good is when I'm on powder. That doesn't necessarily mean I'm addicted to it. I can choose to feel terrible. Addiction is such an ugly word anyway. What's it called when you just really, really want something more and more frequently? Not knowing where else to turn, I check my phone again. And there it is, a text from my personal saviour. And not just because he always has the highest grade powder in the city, although it is an attractive attribute. Now, is all the message reads, followed by 11. It's a code or sorts, easy enough to decipher. Just so I won't look too desperate, I let almost a full minute go by before responding, carefully typing, OK. I hit send. Looking out the wall to all window, the city looks moist with excitement. Or maybe it's just rain. The two hours until 11pm are spent preparing a tumbler of alcohol, showering, lathering up, carefully shaving, laying out my outfit, putting it on, all the while wondering if my ex will be there. Was it just a coincidence Natalie came to the conclusion that we were no longer compatible the day before Roger canned me? As the account manager for High Octane Energy, I oversaw a spot featuring a young male gazzling, guzzling can after can of the caffeinated drink in super-fast motion, tossing the empties away like a wood chipper and blasting into outer space. It wasn't my best work, but it apparently inspired a co-ed to attempt to replicate the act. With his roommate recording, he managed to get down his 15th can of HO before his heart blew a gasket. The video of the fatal seizure went viral, then became a full-blown pandemic. The ad was yanked, only to be resurrected on disapproving news shows, anxious to play it under the guise of reporting on irresponsible advertising. The commercial and the video playing back-to-back, -back, forever linked. And all that free publicity kept boosting its ranking on video sites. It takes me a few seconds to register the number of views. Nine digits? Is that even possible? At least I can say I created one of the most watched commercials in history. Pouring another drink, I tried to take my mind off the death of my career, and the kid, by scrolling through social media feeds. In a moment of weakness, I have a sudden urge to send a message out into the shallow end of the universe too. Maybe I just want people to know I'm still alive and kicking. Maybe, like most postings, it's a subtle cry for help. At almost the same time, my succinct message now goes out. I'm pinged with a message that says, here. Taking my well-worn cashmere jacket off the bed, I head out the door and down the hall. The elevator is waiting for me on my floor. What are the odds of that? The lift whisks me down eight floors to the white marble lobby. Tonight feels lucky. Like something good is going to happen. It could just be the promise of powder. No, it's more than that. What is more than that? Outside, water droplets pelt my coat, between a sprinkle and a rain, a dry clean and a wash and stain. A reinforced steel door swings open off the backside of a rented luxury Bearcat urban transport vehicle, UTV. The converted military truck comes complete with bulletproof windows and extra plating. Unnecessary extras where we're going tonight. Avoiding a puddle, I step up and look inside the mobile man cave to the three metrosexuals. Hugo, the good-natured, handsome golden lab. Grey, in a tailored business suit. His unbuttoned pink Oxford says he's ready to party. And James. The door shuts behind me like a vault as I slide in next to Hugo, who tosses a thick flop of blonde hair in my direction. There he is! Get this man a drink! How about a... High octane never gets old. Wow, metrosexual. I haven't heard that word for about 10 years now. Ah, oh, it takes me back. First reaction there, I see. Really, really well written. Um, really interesting narrator's voice. Um, I'm, I'm not necessarily getting dystopia yet, though. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, very short and sweet and to the point, Katie. Yeah, I think it's um, very commercial. Um, echoes of. Um, I did think it was heading towards dystopia. I thought it was sort of echoes of Mad Men, but brought up to date. What with his yeah. drink that went wrong, the drink yeah. product that went yeah. wrong, yeah. and uh, and the language, you get the feeling that the writer knows Raymond Chandler and has read in that genre. There's a sort of sense of that kind of bite. Um, this is an anti-hero. You know, I'm not I'm not relating to the narrator at all. Yeah, not yet. So per personally, no, personally, I'm not sure that the writer would be able to keep me on board. But I can see a market for it for sure. Okay, so um, my my reaction is um, I don't see the big idea yet, um, and I would need a big idea. I like I like the spa style. I always always appreciate that. I, I, I like a spa style. It, it just works better these days. Um, um, addiction, uh, denial, fairly you know common topics basically. Uh, blipfoots, yeah, the idea of a commercial product that goes seriously wrong. Blipfoots, if anybody remembers what they are. Uh, yeah, again, no, okay, nice idea, sort of techno dystopia, but not completely new. Um, what I need, though, is I need to be hooked very strongly by a big idea, and I don't see where that big idea is coming at the moment. So, but it might be, there might be something around the corner. Um, so, I guess you can see I'm inching towards turning the page. But what would you do, Icy? Oh, I would turn the page as well, because I'm, I'm hoping that that sort of hook is is. is possibly yeah. on the next page or something yeah so you're kind of like all yeah. right yeah i totally get where you're going now okay and katie yeah i'm i'm hovering between turn the page and disengage the hook is that he's killed the kid but he didn't yeah. mean to yeah and i'm thinking the promise of powder there's there's a title there's another title for it the promise of, the promise powder. of powder because the, yeah this character is sending out a cry for help he yeah. suggests that's right yeah, I I rather like that. I'm not mad about the peacemakers as a title. Problem is a bird, right? Oh, yeah, I could go with that. Yeah, there you go. Free suggestion, Dan Jeff. Um, thank you very much. I think that increasingly, guys, with this kind of genre, we are we are looking for a big big hook. You know, I mean, just imagine. I've I've said this a number of times now, but imagine poor little Peter Cox on the phone Monday morning. Hello, Mr. Publisher. I've got a new idea for you, a fantastic new book, and it's all. So you've got to, you have to give me the phone pitch, basically. If there's a big idea there, then everybody will get very, very excited about it. If there's not, then it's a harder sell. Not impossible, but a harder sell. And hopefully there is a big idea there, but we, we ain't quite got to it yet. Hi, I'm Mo Hara. I'm author of My Big Fat Zombie Goldfish and Romeosaurus and Juliet Rex. Uh, I've got a writing tip for you today, and that is always start, well, in my mind, how I write, start with the character. I think if you know your main character, your protagonist, inside and out, what they have for breakfast, what they hide under their bed, all that good juicy stuff, then you will be able to write them with an authentic voice. So hot seat your character, find out everything you can about that character before you start writing about them. Okay, good luck with your writing. Yeah, and that was Mo um, telling us twice how important it is to know what your character has for breakfast. So I guess, I guess it's really important, actually, that you know that. Here are our submissions today. We've had The Peacemaker. Dogs of Doom is next. Shall we have a look at the, um, the blurb? I think we should. Here it is. Dogs of Doom. This is an adventure chapter book. Hmm. Interesting, that chapter book. A chapter book is a is a book that is in chapters, of course, isn't it? And it's kind of one up on picture books. So you go from picture books to chapter books, and people usually say about seven to ten years old, something like that. Um, this is Sarah's blurb. 11-year-old Max dreams of becoming Dan Steele, the lead character in his favourite book series, when a mysterious stranger gifts him a special leather-bound edition of a new Dan Steele novel. His dream comes true, and he's sucked into its pages to live the story. But it isn't all as he expected. Max has to flee dangerous dogs, cross rickety rope bridges, and close down an illegal diamond mine. Impossible? Not with his two new friends, and a whole lot of bravery he never knew he had. 
So let me tell you about Sarah. Sarah, oh yeah, this is absolutely bang smack in the middle of many uh, submissions demographics, actually. Sarah says, I'm a mum to a 10-year-old avid reader who's both my number one fan and biggest critic. And I'm a primary teaching assistant. I write children's fiction from chapter books to young adult. In that case, Sarah, I think we need to get it read for you straight away. The first page. Dogs of Doom by Sarah, read by Emily. Dan Steele skidded to a halt at the edge of the ravine. The bridge that stretched across the chasm in front of him swayed perilously in the breeze before disappearing into a dense mist. It was not a good bridge. Its rotten wooden boards were tied together with rope which had definitely seen better days. Worse still, Dan could see many of the boards were missing, leaving its length pockmarked with gaping holes. Stepping forward, he scraped the toe of his shoe on the board at his feet and watched as the wood crumbled into dust. It didn't look as though it would take his weight, but he really didn't have any other option. He glanced over his shoulder, listened for any sound, for then, but he could only hear the blood rushing in his ears as his heart thundered in his chest. What should he do? If he stayed where he was, they would be sure to find him, and when they did, they would kill him. But one false step across the bridge and he would plunge to his death onto the rocks below. There was no time to decide. The frantic howls of the creatures shattered the silence and Dan's blood turned to ice. They found him. Taking a deep breath, he stretched his leg towards the first plank. Max! It's time to go to sleep. Close your book and lights off now, please. But Mum! Dan has just escaped the dogs and he's about to cross a really dangerous bridge and he might fall and I need to find out. No buts, Max. It's a school night. Lights out. Now. Reluctantly, Max closed the book. His fingers traced the raised letters on the soft leather cover. Dogs of Doom. It had been his absolute favourite birthday present. Not only was it a Dan Steele book he'd never seen before, it was also a super special edition with an ornate black cover instead of the usual cardboard. He'd been faking yawns all evening to get an early night so he could read it. And now he was, he really didn't want to put it down. With a sigh, he carefully placed the book on his bedside table and turned out the light. Good night, Mum. Sweet dreams, love. As his mum softly closed the door, Max snuggled deeper into his duvet, a small smile on his lips as he thought about the dream he would have. Every night was the same. Max had incredible dreams about whichever book he'd been reading, and in his dreams he was the hero, battling bad guys and saving the day. Even better, he knew that tonight he'd have a dream he'd never had before. Would he be lost in a jungle, or in the cooking pot of a tribe of cannibals, or canoeing along rapids and dodging crocodiles? Whatever it was, he was ready for it. With these thoughts tumbling around his head, Max closed his eyes and drifted off to sleep. It took him a moment to get his bearings. He was stood at one end of a rope bridge, the same rope bridge that Dan Steele was about to cross, which could only mean one thing. There would be dogs, and they would be chasing him. Not daring to look behind, he took his first step onto the bridge. Splinters crumbled from the planks as his foot landed, and Max froze, not daring to put any more weight on the dangerously rotten woodwork. His heart hammered in his chest and his mind raced. Maybe, maybe he didn't need to cross this bridge. Maybe there was actually another way across, a way that Dan hadn't seen. Or maybe he didn't have to cross the ravine at all. He'd not heard any sign of the dogs after all. No howling, no barking, nothing. So maybe they'd given up the chase? Yes, that was it. He looked over his shoulder and his heart sank. There, no more than a couple of metres away, over a dozen dogs silently crept forward, their bodies low to the ground and their amber eyes gleaming with hunger. Oh dear, there's poor old Max just about to become a dog's dinner, I think. Katie, how did, how did that make you feel? How did it make me feel? It made me feel, uh, I thought that it was a competent, competent opening, mm -hmm. and then it went rather pedestrian. There's a lot of overwriting, um, the perilously doing this, the dense mist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, just strip it out a little. Um, it had me thinking of things like... Um, where the wild things are. I understand it's an older yeah. age group. Yeah. And the author's got a bit of a problem here, hasn't she? Because she's going between Dan, 
and Max in the book. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know how she's going to resolve that. I mean, if the character in the book is also called Max and Max wanted this book because the hero in it is called Max, she's not going to have to do this awkward segueing, is she? But um, yeah, yeah. It's starting to become a bit whatever. Um, I'm not. Sh- I'm not sure these days. Um, I'm not sure how much grab it's got in terms yeah. of pacing and yeah. world building for yeah. the age group that she's aiming at. It's 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 competent, but sl- underpowered. I think as an opening. Yeah, that's interesting. You said these days because it actually felt very old-fashioned to me. Um, not bad because I mean you know old-fashioned is not necessarily bad actually Sarah um, you know I mean a lot of people who read how who is one of the funny things about publishing is you meet lots of interesting people and you have me- meals and drinks with a lot of interesting people but you never met any of the people who rejected Harry Potter no 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 never meet them whoever they are um, I think one of the reasons for rejecting Harry Potter is kind of old, old fashioned, actually. Yeah, it's nothing new. It's kind of, you know, it's an amalgam of things that are people have written about previously, a bit of T.H. White, a bit of this, the other. And um, actually, it turned out that's what people really liked. So it's not a bad thing to say it's old fashioned, but it feels a bit boys' own to me. The upside is that it, there's a cozy feeling to it, but I'm not sure that youngsters are absolutely in that mindset at the moment but who knows possibly i see is in that mindset at the moment how did that make you feel i actually really enjoyed it mm. um however it had a very jumanji kind of feel to it yeah so i yeah. guess it would probably appeal to the nostalgia of kind of my generation who loved yeah. the original jumanji yeah and Good point. Language-wise, it kind of seemed aimed a little bit older as well. So again, if, if it's meant to be aimed at younger mm. kids, I'm kind of that that kind of read a bit old. Yeah. Um, and I'm a bit confused because it said in the blurb that he was sucked into the book, but yet he's actively got the ability to enter books in his yeah. dreams. That's cool. Lead with that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good advice, actually, actually. Very good. Um, so... <sighs> It's not neo disruptive. It's not trying to be neo disruptive. Maybe I'm looking for too many things that are new and disruptive today. I'm looking for a big idea, looking for disruptive ideas. Maybe we don't want that. Jumanji, very good pitch line there. Um, and I forgot to say thank you to Emily for a terrific reading. Never let it be said I'm taking Emily for granted. Thank you, Emily. Another, another absolute top notch delivery there. Um, so carrying on, I see. What are you going to choose? Oh, I'd turn the page on this one as well. Or a page turn on that too. That's very good. And Katie? I'm between turning the page and disengaging, I'm sorry. Somewhere Mm. between those two. So it's about 50% Mm. for you then. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, I I would definitely turn the page to see where it goes. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely a page, page turn on this, and um, I will give it the benefit of the doubt, even more so now, since um, IC has put Jumanji, Jumanji in my head. Hello, my name's Alan Burrows, uh, the author of Ironheart. Uh, my writing tip today is to uh, use short words, use short sentences and short paragraphs, brevity in all things. Uh, many writers, uh, I think particularly early on in their careers, uh, tend to over-describe scenes, over-describe people. Um, it's probably the biggest flaw uh, I see when I'm look- reviewing somebody else's text. Um, so I would say, always look at your text and think, could I say this more simply? Um, or to quote Elmore Leonard, um, try to leave out the parts that readers tend to skip. Yeah, so good. I've, I've heard that before, but that's uh, absolutely good advice there. So let's just talk to IC for a few moments before we go on to our third submission of the day. I see we've got a website for you here. Actually, we've got a podcast for you too. Tell us about this. Yeah, that was a complete accident. Um, I'd started, I mean, I've been blogging about folklore since 2016. Um, and good piece of advice just for anyone who has a blog, start adding another way for people to consume the content. 
So yeah. I started doing audio versions. I mean, I didn't think anyone would want to hear my accent because um, it's not the well, second We do. Or what? We do. It's fabulous. <laughs> it's fabulous. Uh, well, it was actually a friend of mine who's Australian was like, no, it's amazing. You should do it. Yeah. Um, and then I started I started doing the audio versions and then just for a laugh, submitted the RSS feed to iTunes and they accepted it. So I was like, oh, yeah, I've got a podcast now. Um, and I really, really, really enjoy doing it. It's so much fun. And, and what does it consist consist of then, really? Um, fifteen minute episodes every week, um, plus okay. monthly book reviews of folklore related titles, and we look at things like um, superstitions, weird legends, um, occult stuff. I mean, we've we've looked mm. at things like alchemy, um, mm. the folklore of flowers, all that kind of lovely fun nice. stuff. Nice. Yeah, yeah, and it's icysedgwick dot com, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the one. Fantastic. Good. Excellent. Thank you very much, Icy. More from Icy and all her... She's quite a prodigious author, is, is Icy, across a number of genres as well. So we will be dipping our, our toe into your various genres in a few moments. But right now, we're going to look at our next submission, which is, I think... Oh, yes. Here we are. Roiken. Now, there's an interesting word. I like that. I like that title straight away. And I like that thing that um, I think is called a minuscule. You see, it's a tiny, tiny, you may not even see on the screen. R-O, but that O's got a slash through it. I think that's that's called a minuscule. I'm not too sure, because I think it's mostly Scandinavian. I don't really know anything from Scandinavia. Maybe Icy does. We'll ask her in a moment. It's horror! Oh, it's right up Icy's street, and it's from Mark McGowan. Roiken is a 73,000-word horror novel about a small village south of Oslo, where mysterious events begin happening and its residents are forced to confront their views of reality. Adrian Hope has always been a caring GP to his patients. Most of his patients are retired and are dependent on prescription painkillers, <laughs> junkies, or regular visits from the county nurse just to get by. Caring for them is one thing, but having to fight off one of his elderly patients from tearing out his throat... There's another. Hmm. I don't think that's normal for, for GPs, but I don't know. Let me tell you about uh, Mark. Mark says, I'm a Brit currently residing in Norway, where I work as a postdoctoral scientist studying multiple myeloma, a blood cancer. I wrote my first book while working on my PhD and finished it just after I submitted my thesis last year. Okay. So... This has got me very excited, actually. Anything that's set in the sort of Scandinavian hinterland, I can do quite well with, and I have done well with in the past. So uh, you've definitely got my attention, Mark. Uh, what else can we do for you? I think what we can do is to get it read today by our Stephen King simulacrum, indeed, Jeff. The first page. Roykin by Mark, read by Jeff. Chapter one. A warm breeze moved the lifeless stalks and three tendrils of the once fruitful corn plants in a rhythmic, swaying motion. The moon, full and proud, flecked the sun in a brilliance that bathed the field in a white hue. The night was still. The moonlight revealed a man laying face down in a small clearing. Dead corn plants had been hacked down in a clumsily aggressive manner earlier that day and were left in unkempt bundles in the clearing. The man lay as still as a corpse, until a howl in the distance stirred him. His eyes snapped open, and he turned his head to on the ground, scraping his cheeks on the abrasive soil. It took several moments before he began to regain some of his senses, and his brain to tune into the surroundings. He looked down at the soil, dark under his face, and realised he was lying face down in the middle of a field. Whoa, what the fuck am I doing here? His voice was soft and lethargic. He could feel his forty-something body ache and moan as if he had been lying there for some time, in the same position, flat on the hard, sun-scorched earth. Forty-something? Years of smoking, drinking and getting into weekly kiffisticuffs with local residents over misplaced eye contact or something more Neanderthal territorial differences left their impressions on his face and body. Forty, going on sixty. His muscles were sore and tender, like he had been running. A flash of memory zipped past his mind's eye. Something had made him run, scared him, but he could not remember why or what it had been. 
For a man that spends most of his time in the bar or sitting in front of the TV watching soccer, he knew his body had been subjected to some additional physical activity. He tried to think, but his mind was missing the required files. Instead, he just curled over like a dull day and refused to work. He moved his hand to ready himself to sit up and felt something hard and cold by his side. A rusty looking machete, dull in the moonlight. The long blade, once proud and sharp, was rusted and blunt with a splintered wooden handle. He felt the edge, but didn't comprehend what it was. With his other hand pulled in, he slowly began to push himself up into a sitting position. He heard a howl in the distance again, but it did not register it this time. Instead, he snuffed at it and rubbed his eyes, smearing aggressive grains of dirt into them, forcing him to blink. The man, now sitting up, his legs in front, looked around to get his bearings. Where the hell was he? His mind was blank to allow any kind of panic of being lost to set in. He turned his head, hearing his neck crack as it twisted. The wind blew through his thinning hair. The smell of dying plants helped jog his memory. He examined his hands. Small blisters and broken to angry skin helped his mind comprehend more of what he was doing here. He had been cutting down those old plants long after harvest had finished some months ago. One of the few workers kept on the farm to tidy up ready for the next season. He looked down at the machete. The old thing was about as useless as a chocolate fire guard. He remembered trying to hack away at the stalks early in the day. The machete was useless at chopping the stalks and took a lot more of his energy to accomplish. Then there was that flash, like someone had crept up on him and flashed a torch into his eyes. Even though he remembered it being very early afternoon and the sun was high, the flash had been very powerful. He remembered a burning sensation which made him raise a hand to his cheek to inspect the damage. No burns or injuries could be felt now. But he did remember the heat of the light. After the flash, he could not remember anything. He tried, but all his mind's eye could show him was white. Okay, we've got a fairly detailed description there of a chap who obviously is in some trouble. Um, horrific enough for you, I see? Sadly, no. Um, I've got a problem with writers starting with a character not knowing where they are and then mm. taking all the time to try and remember what's happened to them. Mm. I kind of want them to wake up and be in peril and it come back to them in yeah. snippets. Yeah. Not enough, not, not enough peril. We've seen it before, haven't we, actually? I mean, it's a trope, it's a cliche. It's, oh, I don't know where I am. What's happened? Whoa, <laughs> what is this murder instrument in my hand? Huh? What's all this blood? I uh, just mm. I don't know why I care, actually. That's the thing. Mark. I mean, you, there's a lot of detailed stuff going on. The chat room is brilliant, of course, as always, giving lots of interesting reactions and advice indeed. Yes, you'll get advice and reactions from our living laboratory. Call the pop-up submissions chat room. So I studied this, this in, in great depth, please, Mark. But the thing is, I don't know why I care about this character. You've got to make me care about him. Um, that's just missing, actually, at the moment. But maybe it's not missing, as far as Kate is concerned. It is missing. Uh, okay. Um, there are four things that strike me as the, um, the tent pegs. The cornfield, yeah. well, that's a creepy old trope, children of the corn and all oh, that. That is Stephen King, that is Stephen King, isn't it, actually? It couldn't be a, a better reader than totally. Jeff. Totally. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, um, and that horror film, 1922, that's very, um, yeah. Stephen yeah. King, that's very cornfield, isn't it? Yeah, he doesn't then, like cornfields, then... does he? No. <laughs> no. No, ca no cans of niblets for Stephen King. Um, <laughs> Fear of niblets. <laughs> Nibletophobia. And then there's the man who is prone, as we say. Yeah. Then there is the machete. Now, when I get to the machete, I think, aha, now now we're coming to it. Yeah. But I was just told how it's rusty. And, and then there's the flash. So for me, the corn, the man, the machete and the flash. Yeah. That's, that's it, what I it? need to be hearing about. Yeah. It's structurally, structurally all over the show. Yeah. Go on. With lots this is, this of, is good um, stuff. Infilling. Mark, pay attention, Mark. Come on. Don't just yes, drift I'm away. Sorry. No, no, no. Go I'm on. Sorry. Go on, Kate. No, no, go on, Kate. This is good stuff. It's like infilled gold jewellery, isn't it? He's infilling all over the place. And phrases such as such and such and such 
helped his mind comprehend. Yeah. Now that yeah. is dense overwriting, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. Uh, corpse, he left the E off, but I'm sure that's just a typo. So well, I'm not like going to kill him for beating. that. <laughs> no, 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 we're not going to kill him for that. But but the corpse is kind of crucial, and it is missing its E. Um, <laughs> so I just think it needs um, it needs back to the drawing board and restructure it, cool. and, and give us a right corker of a first line, please. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, I would I would say uh, in Mark's defence, I guess he's going to say it builds, um, but. <laughs> I mean, I guess you've got to grab people right from the first page with horror. If you don't, then I think we're going to drift away. And I, 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 you know, one of the fundamental questions that you've got to ask yourself really is why are people reading? You get to the bottom of the first page and you think, why, why actually is anyone reading this? And why are they going to turn the page? If you can answer that, then you're doing all right. If you can't, then maybe you need to think quite carefully about the words you put on that page. Um, I've got to care. I've got, I've got to have some something invested in that in 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 it. There's got to be some reasons that drives me forward emotionally. And as I've discussed many times with many publishers, publishing is all about emotion. And it's about the, your ability as a writer to, to evoke emotion from, from the reader. If you can do that, you can control the sort of emotions that people are feeling. You will make a lot of money out of writing. So, Katie, take a view. Take a few. Okay, um, just just following on from what you were just saying there. If there had been more landscape, I was thinking Samuel Palmer paintings at the at the start. I would hang on with it for the landscape, yeah. for the journey. Yeah, uh, I would maybe. have turned the page for that. Yeah. I would have as a matter yeah. of personal taste, but okay. I'm disengaging based on the current sub. Right, fair enough. And I'm betting that's what Ice is going to do, but I could be wrong. I really wanted to like it, and I think the setting is cool, and the blurb is cool. So mm -hmm. if, yeah, me, me too. And the name is the title's it. great, isn't it? Yeah, you, yeah, I like the title. Yeah, just yeah. retweak it to match so that the promise is there. At the moment, I'm going to have to say disengage, but I do think yeah. that there's enough promise there that with a bit of, yes. a bit of tweaking, it'll, it'll be a corker. Yeah, I think I think we're all reluctant disengages, Mark, and we 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 want we're all behind you on this. We we want to be utterly horrified. So just go in, go in and do it, please. Hi, I'm Peter Laws, author of the Mad Hunter crime fiction novels. Click on the link to buy the latest one called Severed. It's really great to be a guest on pop-up submissions today. And I've got a writing tip I'd like to give you. Don't wait for inspiration to strike. Just get that derriere of yours on the chair and start typing. A plumber doesn't wait for the muse to come. He just fixes the tap. So you're a writer. Sit down and write. I know it's not easy, but you can do it. So hope that tip helps. <laughs> There you go, a little pep talk there from Peter Laws, who, uh, again, is... I, have you heard of Peter Laws, actually? I see he, um, he's both a, a writer of horror and a vicar, would you believe, a reverend. Isn't that cool? Really? That's yeah, awesome. totally, yes. <laughs> yeah, he's a cool dude, actually. Like, now, here we are, we're looking at Isis Cedric's Amazon page. A lot of stuff here. Talk us yeah. through it. Talk us through it. Um, you know how they always say that you should stick to one genre so it makes it easier to market what you do? I kind well, of I just thought, that. yeah, no, I'm not going to. I'm not going yeah, to do so that. I just sort of wandered <laughs> off. <laughs> okay, so tell, tell us a bit about what we, we're seeing here. Um, the first two books are my Magic and Mayhem series, so they're like dark fantasy. And the first one came about because it's a retelling of The Sorcerer's Apprentice, mm -hmm. but if the brooms were actually bloodthirsty mummies. And then the sequel continues that. Um, and then two of those books are actually collections that I've just got a story in. But uh, Harbingers and Black Dog are just collections of short stories I wrote. And um, so if you like kind of Mr. Jamesy and oh, yeah. sort of spooky kind of gothic yeah. horror, then yeah. Black Dog is the one to go for. I see multiple choices here from from. Uh, I see. Um, how did you how did you get into this this dreadful dreadful area of writing? I see. What went wrong in your life? <laughs> Oh, oh God! Um, I don't know. I've always been interested in ghost stories. Um, I've, I've I've read them since I was well for as long as I can remember. Hmm. Every time I went on holiday anywhere, if it was like, oh, let's go to a stately home. Did anyone get murdered here? Oh. Um, you know, usual wholesome. Stuff Why are you a goth? Family. Why are you a goth? Obviously, 
I still am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't say Sorry, that necessarily because you're not, you're not, you're not fully goffed out tonight. But uh... it's Sunday, man. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I've always liked goths. I like goths. You know, an amazing number of goths. I, I, I used to know certainly. Maybe it's just the ones I used to know who were actually vegan years, decades before it was fashionable to be vegan. Not quite sure Ahead why. Very much so. Very much so. Ahead of the curve, yeah. We'll talk more to, to Icy and her gothic friends uh, in just a moment. But right now, I think we should look at submission number four. And this is from George, Georgia Forum. It's autobiography slash urban drama. And it's called A Ghetto Estate of Mind. A little play on words there. A Ghetto Estate of Mind. And this is what... Uh, George sent us as the blurb. Greetings. This body of work is an autobiography about my growing up in South East London. It recaps the days of my past from birth all the way to the day when I go to university. Essentially, these are my memoirs. This is my first attempt at writing a book. My story goes through the different stages of my life from a boy to a man. My father died at a young age and my mother became a dependent alcoholic afterwards. My life begins to change when I move in with my mother for the worse oh so this is tough and gritty i i'll be bound uh, full of uh south london street uh let me tell you about george uh george is currently working in a nine to five day job to pay the bills and graduated from university studying film production in 2017 i hope he says to one day move to the usa to follow my career goals i draw and write in my spare time i love computer games and i indulge watching japanese animes i go to the gym a lot and chicken kurma is my favorite curry dish <laughs> right so i think we know you pretty well actually already thank you george for that um and who will we get who shall we possibly get to give a little bit of south london cred a little bit of the tom hardy's maybe I know. The type is very own Tom Hardy. It's got to be rich. The first page. A Ghetto Estate of Mind by George. Read by Rich. Intro. At the tender age of six years old, I was sexually molested. At the age of ten, I had a shotgun pointed at my face. At the age of twelve, my dad had died. And by the time I was fourteen, my mother was a chronic alcoholic and my life was going down a wrong path. By the time I reached 21, I had been stabbed three times and had become a well-known drug dealer, another unfortunate black statistic of South East London streets. My life wasn't easy, not at all, but whose is? All that matters in life is actions, not words. Words have a big part to play in our lives, but actions prove to be more significant. I do miss them, the people of my past. I miss them dearly. I've had a fucked up childhood, and it will show throughout this book of mine, but it has also been bliss. This is a story about trust, commitment, loyalty, betrayal, love, hate, sorrow and joy, and all of that other good stuff. But really and truly, this book is about me, my mother and my friends. My friendship and the people I've met in life and how they may have affected me because one way or another, we're all affected by each other, just by being around one another, sharing stories, telling jokes, talking about your inner feelings, gossiping about girls or who's beefing on the ends. I don't know how I made it this far. I really don't. Growing up the way I did and where I was from, you had to be strong. For they say only the strong survive. I know one thing. I know one day life will get better. I just don't know when that day will come. Life is what you make it, so whatever you want to do, go out and try to achieve that goal. And if not, then at least one day you can say you died trying. God loves a trier, so keep trying. Some people have had tough lives, but none of them share a pain as deep as mine. Their pain is their own pain, whereas my pain cuts deep like a knife cuts through butter. Through all the hardship and the struggles, you just have to be strong. And keep your head up, my brothers and sisters. Reach for the stars. For we came from the bottom, and the only way now is up. Look how far we have come. Now let's see how far we can go. Chapter 1. Blood of a Slave, Heart of a King. 
All my life I've heard the name George. TV, radio, newspapers and films, you name it. It is probably the most, or at least one of the most popular names in the UK. A lot of great people throughout history have had that name, so I guess I am lucky. I was born George Adam Tarasai of Forum on December the 8th, 1986, in Guy's Hospital, central London. I was a beautiful child. I ain't too bad looking as a man either, if I may say so myself. In my younger days, I was your typical fat kid in the class, but as I grew older, I slimmed down like most of us do growing up. I am the creation of two migrant Africans who met around 1981, 83, in a South London African restaurant. My father's name was Samuel C. Oforum, but everyone just called him Sam. My mother, Wilma Barbara Kayangarara. I know it's a tongue twister. My old man came from Nigeria, and my mum travelled from Zimbabwe. I grew up in South East London, in Lewisham Borough, down in New Cross. I spent my first 12 years of my life down there. Good people's down there. People that I would never forget, but also some people that I would rather forget. We lived in an estate on top of a big-ass hill called Drakefell Road. I'm telling you, the hill was epic to walk up, no word of a lie. Anyone who has lived on it knows what I'm saying, but still, I didn't mind it back then. Back then, imagination was everything. Right, straight to you, I think, Icy. First reactions, please. Um, that's obviously not uh, something I have any experience with, but that was quite a, quite a powerful way to start, I think. Although I kind of felt like that first section felt more like a voiceover that you would get on a film. Yeah. And the whole way through, I thought this would be a cracking audio book. Oh, yeah. Sort of obviously, actually. you know, with, yeah. with narration yeah. like yeah. that, the, the yeah. voice works really, really well. So I yeah, kind of yeah. think that... That could be something, I think. I think, actually, I don't know if you noticed this. I don't know if you know Rich's voice as well as we do, the regulars, but he got more into that as as it progressed. I think he realised, you know, yeah. the sort of dimensions of the character and he brought more and more out of that. Mm. Uh, yeah, well, we're right. talk about audiobooks. I mean, our narrators do do audiobooks. If you're uh, uh, an author right now looking for someone to do an audiobook, you've got a good range of narrators here. And um, there will be a link on the website any day now to uh, to click through to them. Thank you very much for that commercial, I see. Is this the sort of, I mean, autobiography? Do you read autobiographies? Very, very rarely. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, it depends who it is. Obviously, I, th I mean, I read Dolly Parton's because she's just the queen, but um, I generally, Dolly I Parton. generally wouldn't. You are goth yeah, I love Dolly Parton. reading Dolly Parton's yeah. autobiography. You know, wonders yeah, will never cease. Amazing. Yeah, it is amazing, actually. <laughs> I love it. Thank you, I see. Katie, first reactions, please. First reactions. Is it an autobiography or is it a memoir? Oh, uh, interesting. Define your well, terms, please. Well, because the author mentions both words himself in respect yes. of this project. Yeah. And they are two different beasts. And uh, I did... Uh, I was certainly engaging um, with the blurb, and then I felt myself slipping away in the intro section, yeah. where he's saying that no one else's pain is to be compared with his pain. Yeah, I was wondering That's about what... that. I, I don't quite get that. What's going on there? No. Well, obviously one feels very much that there has been a great deal of struggle yeah. for him, yeah. uh, not discounting that at all, but you cannot... It, it alienates me because you cannot look at somebody and think you know where they have been and what they mm. are dealing with right now and put it on a s sliding scale mm. with your own. That's because so if he's going, yeah. because if he's writing a story yeah. from his heart about yeah. himself, then he needs to take his reader with him and not say, "Oh, forget your pain. You can hear about my pain." The autobiography question is because. Um, once he launches into the main bit of writing, yeah. it's an info dump. Yeah, that's right. Um, and and a, a memoir starts with an inciting event, episode, mm. memory. And I felt, I did feel that the last line uh, that was read out would have been, would have been a line that would work as the intro for a memoir. Back then, imagination was everything. Good line. 
I thought that was a good line, and yeah. I felt that that's where it needed to start. But for the for the time being, it's it's a stream of consciousness. I'm not being invited in. I'm just there to listen, and so mm. I'm disengaging. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is typical of um, a lot of submissions that people see, uh, agents and publishers. There's an in, a very interesting person, a very interesting story. No, I'm not going to use that word because I'm going to redefine what I mean by that. Very interesting history, life history, lots of experience, very interesting voice coming through. Um, George, if you're, if you're, I don't think you're with us at the moment, I can't see you, but if you are watching the recording, have a look and see what people are saying in the chat room right now. And apart from Kate saying another ex-goth here who has also been a lifelong Dolly fan. Must be a thing. We've discovered something about goths tonight. Oh, I, Dolly Parton. Good grief. Um, so the thing is this. Uh, you've, got, you've got a great voice. That comes through very strongly. Um, and that's very precious, actually, because it's rare, actually. It's very rare. You don't get a strong voice coming through in submissions very much. And mostly what people try to do is they, they try to copy somebody else because they think that's the sort of thing that they're supposed to write and they end up with no voice at all. And you don't actually know who, who the author is at all. You don't, feel, you don't have a, a personal connection with them at all. Uh, and you have got a strong voice and that's coming through. Um, so everything I'm going to say in the, in the next moment or two, uh, you've, got to, you've got to bear in mind that do not lose your voice, right? Uh, you've got to learn some, some more things if, if, you want to, if you want to write. Uh, especially if you want to write commercially. But don't let that learning process take your voice away. Don't let anybody say to you, oh, this is not quite right. Can't you write a little more? No, 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 no. You keep the voice, but learn a few uh, tricks. And that's tricks. Yes, tricks. Literary tricks. Just learn some basic tricks. When you look at someone's life, what happens to them is, is incoherent. It's not structured. Things happen. They just happen. Um, and sometimes you're lucky enough to find many and significance. We're always looking for many and significance, but usually it just, it's just a series of events that happen. One thing does lead on to another, but it's not really a structured story. And, you know, and humans love to, to, to feel there is structure there. So it's one of the crucial things that writers do is, is to create structure out of really chaos. And there's, there isn't an essential structure there. It's very in, internal what, what you're doing here. It's very internal. It's probably a necessary process, actually that you're, you're going through, probably necessary. Um, and I'm not sure ultimately there is a commercial market for this story. It may not be at all, actually. But what you're going through is a, is a learning curve. And if you learn more about story and structure, then you'll have two fantastic tools. You'll have a terrific voice and you'll have an ability to selectively cut, paste, put stuff together so the structure of what you're saying is very, very strong. And then, then you'll be on, on I think, uh, um, uh, a, winning, a winning curve with those two things. Um, hope that makes some sense. Let's go back to you, Katie, and take a view, not on what you'd like it to be, but what you've seen in front of you right now. Um, well, I hate to seem to pour a downer. I'm disengaging, but okay. uh, um, could I mention to the author... If he follows, if he uses Twitter and he follows Hachette Future Bookshelf, they have opened subs, well, they have had the last couple of years, uh, May and June. And if he's really interested in, in carrying on with this project, um, they are particularly, particularly keen to discover such stories, such Fine. voices. Fine. Good. Excellent. There you go. Useful tip. But you're disengaging what you've read. I see. But I'm just, disenga- yes. Um, I'm actually going to say I probably would turn the page just because it is a, a background I've got no experience on. And I think the voice was strong enough that I was kind of keen because it, he, he'd done such a good job in the opening of mentioning that it wasn't just going to be all doom and gloom. I was kind of yeah. curious to see how we were yeah. going to do that. Yeah. 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 I would, I would read on for a bit too. Um, just really to confirm that it is going to be, you know, then I did this and then I did that and then something else happened and I, basically without the, the story structure because this is the first thing that, that George had written. But um, I, think, I think you should be reasonably, reasonably encouraged by that, George, when we wish you well. Hiya, I'm Peter Laws. 
author of the Mad Hunter crime fiction novels. You can click on the link to buy the latest one, which is called Severed. It's good to be a guest on pop-up submissions today. When it comes to getting published, don't just expect rejection, embrace it. I know that's it's not an easy thing because to be rejected over and over again is pretty horrible. I know I've had that experience, but it is par for the course. And don't think you might not get it, you will. But realize that rejection actually, as horrible as it can be, can sometimes force you to work harder and to get better. It hurts, it's true, but it could be a tool to focus the mind. So hold your nerve, keep going. Ah, Hope that helps. Yeah, of course it helps. Absolutely, of course it helps. Fantastic advice there from Peter Laws. Uh, horror writer Peter Laws, Reverend Peter Laws. Embrace your rejection. Oh, yes. Uh, now, we're getting towards the end of the show, sadly. Um, I need to tell you one or two things. First of all, voting is absolutely possible on the, and open right now. Let's just have a look. Oh, wow. That's 100% the moment for Dogs of Doom. Wow. Can I hit refresh? And we'll see. Yeah, it's still 100%. Everyone is expressing a view, and they think Dogs of Doom is the best submission today. That's probably going to change. Well, I don't know it's going to change, but it might change because we've got one more submission coming up. Uh, if it right at, down at the bottom, Wizards and Whiskey, Order of the Lager by Rob Stokes. How interesting that is. I think that you'd like me to, to read Rob's blurb. Here it is. Wizards and Whiskey, Order of the Lager, Urban Fantasy Satire by Rob Stokes. There's a world, writes Rob in his blurb, there's a world where modern technology meets magic and myth. Hmm. Where dragons review each other's lairs online and wizards are suffering a job crisis. This world is in peril from a demonic invasion and the only people trying to save it are Chip, a bookish, socially awkward student, Morgan, an aspiring adventurer, her repugnant ex-boyfriend, Morris, bitter mage, Oizang, and Ugrat, a troll with anxiety disorder. However, they find that the world they're trying to save is their biggest obstacle. Oh, shades of Mr. Pratchett, eh? No? I think so. I also think this is kind of up Ice's Street as well. We don't, we don't, you know, try and match these submissions up to our special guests, but it does happen like that sometimes. Let me tell you about uh, Rob. Rob is uh, a Hull-based writer. I currently work as a carer for young people, says, says Rob, with learning disabilities and mental health issues. And this will be my second novel. I've always been fascinated with storytelling of all types, having worked on short films, video games and theatre, uh, though books are my first love. When I'm not nose deep in a new book or caring, I can be found either training in Muay Thai kickboxing or working through my whiskey collection. Hopefully not both at the same time. So what I'm doing is I'm scratching my head thinking, who can we get? Rob Stokes to read your your amazing work of Wizards and Whiskey and I think possibly the right person for this would be the person who can do vocal characterizations of goblins and goblinettes very easily really it's got to be Georgina isn't it Wizards and Whiskey by Rob read by Georgina there was a dreadful rumble within the walls of the Apple and Vine Inn the howling storm outside seemed to suck away the brightness through the windows, shadows clawing all inside with gnarled black fingers. The only light to break through were the flashes of raindrops whipping against the windows with fury, almost cracking through the glass with a constant clack, clack, clack. The sound smothered the small, otherwise silent room, with the aging chairs and tables preventing an echo. The only part of the floor that wasn't covered with legs of people and furniture was the bar, where a lone portly innkeeper stared out to a sea of unhappy patrons. Most were garbed in furs, obscured from sight, and hunched over their drinks like praying mantises. The innkeeper hissed a little under his breath and briefly, briefly glanced up to the broadsword that hung above his head. It was an appropriate metaphor for the situation he found himself in. He looked back to the crowd. Even the faces he recognised had turned unfriendly. Eventually, there was a creaking of wood against the hard floor. A hooded figure, quite close to the bar, began to rise from her seat. Her fingers went to her hood, though they were more like talons than actual hands, with how gnarled and sharp they were. 
The skin was a most inhuman green, that much was obvious. The hood fell away, revealing that the figure was, in fact, a goblin. Her green skin was almost black in the darkness, a no crooked nose directed at the innkeeper, and long cat-like ears juddering. The goblin snarled, exposing a golden tusk beneath her lips, and from beneath her robes an arm raised accusingly to the innkeeper. We are growing impatient, barkeep. The goblin hissed, her voice rumbling like coals about to explode into flames. The rest of the bar nodded in agreement, poised to leap to the innkeeper. The innkeeper, however, raised one of his slab-like hands and the crowd cowed a little. Look, I know it's been a while, but we're still working on it, he said calmly. The goblin sneered to him and beads of sweat fled from his brow. All you've been doing is turning it off and on again for the past ten minutes. That's all the Wi-Fi man told me to do. The innkeeper felt quite indignant now. Here he was having, no, having to tend to grumpy customers all day and all night and all anyone could do right now was tell him that the Wi-Fi wasn't working or ask him why the Wi-Fi wasn't working or demand to know when the Wi-Fi would be working. Why, he thought, couldn't they ring the service provider and bully them instead? Can't you ring someone and get them down here? The goblin demanded. Actually, I have a question for you, Mrs. Goblin, the innkeeper shouted back, visibly bristling. What are you even doing on the internet in a pub anyway? Just drink up and be miserable in silence like everyone else. You know, Dad, came two words from his side, and immediately the innkeeper's face fell. If you let me go to Wizards Academy, then I could cast a spell and create our own network. You wouldn't even need to pay for internet anymore. No such spell exists, Damien, the innkeeper growled, pointedly looking away from the young man that he knew was looming by his side. Does too, does not. And I'll be eaten by dragons before I pay 15 bloody grand for you to piss off to the Elven Kingdoms and waste your time wearing dresses. Their robes, Dad. Your mum's already been through this with you. You're not going to Wizard Academy. If business goes well, then maybe we can afford to get your night classes for some necromancy. Now go serve drinks. I hate you, Dad, so much. <laughs> your parenting's almost as bad as your Wi-Fi connection. The goblin piped up smugly. Then her eyes widened as a rag came flying her way. She only just ducked her head out the way, a scowl settling back on her face. Well there. Oh, I wonder what you make of that. I think, who should we get to, uh, to react? I think it's got to be Icy, actually, hasn't it? Yes. Icy. First reactions, please. I love the title. The title is awesome. Yeah. Um, I'm not 100% sure what's going on in the, in the submission, though, and I noticed in the chat box at the bottom, somebody noticed that the... The point of view seemed to shift quite substantially. Uh, yes. <laughs> which is a bit confusing. Um, yes. And I, I, what I really, really, really wanted to like it, and it kind of almost started to have shades of Tom Hold. Um, but yeah, I'm like wizards and Wi Fi. Like, I'm not really sure. Okay. Uh, how uh, I feel about that. Not really pressing your buttons, is it? So I was, I was, I mean, this is kind of Harry Potter across Terry Pratchett. Uh, agents and publishers get an awful lot of uh, Terry Pratchett type submissions. And to be honest, we're looking for the next Terry Pratchett, please. I mean, you know, if you're out there, don't hesitate. Publishing needs you, definitely. Um, vocal characterization was excellent, Georgina. You have got that goblin down to a T, I'd say. Uh, Rob, can I just say to you, please, um, you did send us, actually, very, very enterprising of you. You did send us a, a, a terrific video that you stuck on YouTube, um, which is a bit more than... Well, you, what, what you can do, if you want to, is you can send us an MP3 file uh, of the reading. But you went ahead and you did the, the full video, which is terrific. We can't show that, unfortunately. Um, partly because technical issues, because we can't easily show it to high-quality uh, YouTube videos, and you do need to see them in 1080 1080p. Uh, otherwise, you can't read the text on the screen. But more important than that, you put some background music on. And background music is a killer for us because what it'll do is it'll 
put a black mark against us on YouTube, assuming that it is uh, copyright controlled, which almost certainly does all the music we use, is licensed. And the music you put on there probably isn't, and we couldn't take the risk. So sorry about that. Um, Katie. Please remind me of the title. Wizards and Whiskey. Order of the right. Lager. It's a pun. It's a joke. Okay. So it's satire. Yeah. 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 Um, what did the author say is the target read readership age-wise? He didn't say that. But I, I mean, I think it's going to be pretty much Pratchett-ish, which means anything from yeah. sort of 11 to 35, 14, maybe older. Yeah. That's what I was thinking of Pratchett. And... Um, I, well, I was looking for the promise, really. Yeah. Um, the dreadful rumble within the walls. <laughs> I still don't know what the flipping dreadful rumble no. is. No, no, no. I mean, I'm, quite, I'm quite liking the goblin. Um, I like the I'm goblin quite liking a lot. the goblin um, giving the publican grief. Yeah. The only yeah. job I ever had. I, I poured my first pint and the man said... You're not giving us that, are you? And I said, it does have a bit of a head on it, doesn't it? It's got a bit of a head. He said, it's got fucking shoulders and all. <laughs> so so uh, I think the writer can have a great deal of fun with this goblin. Yeah, I think so giving too. The, giving the bartender grief. But it's there are dialogue tags all over the show. There's yeah. dumping and extra and massive over-description all over the show. Yeah. I just feel that the – I would like the writer to just – Go back to the drawing board with the essential premise and uh, put himself in a kind of a straitjacket. Yeah. Offer us the bait, which is this dreadful rumble, and yeah. then please <laughs> give us a thread that we can follow. Because I, yeah. I just got lost and then my mind's wandered off because I couldn't connect. Yeah, okay. Well, I mean, I, I have to have to agree. And, you know, you know what agents are, hopeless optimists. I mean, I was just hoping and hoping that it actually was going to be pretty close to, to Pratchett. Um, well, I still think with some editing it might be, but um, <clears throat> yeah, back on planet Earth again. Uh, yeah, I think all the points uh, you both make are absolutely right. Ah, uh, chat room. What's the chat room saying? Less description, more hook. Absolutely. Fun ideas, says Ancora. Needs more structure. Yeah, direction, a sense of story. But good ideas. Yeah, and people agree with that. Okay, so thing is, everyone, everyone shoots for this market. You know, you, I have lost count of the number of Pratchett type submissions I've seen, and it, it's, it appears that only Terry Pratchett can do Terry uh, can do Terry Pratchett. Actually, that's what it appears. So there is there is a vacancy there. Um, what are we going to say in that case, I see? Um, I'm torn really because there was enough that I would want to keep reading just to see. Yeah, I would. Like yeah. where it went. Yeah. But then at the same time, I was kind of finding myself a little bit like, I don't know who, who these are compared yeah. to the names that are mentioned in the blurb. Yeah, um, yeah. I suppose I'd turn the page, but, you know, there'd have to be something pretty spectacular on the next one. Yeah, you're going to turn the page once, and then oh. who knows? Yeah, after that. All right, and uh, Katie? I'm really sorry. Uh -oh. What I really mean by this is... Oh, no. Oh, no. I feel a shred sure. is coming. Drawing board. I really mean drawing board. Take his idea and go back to the drawing board. It's a mess. Shred it. Look. No! No! Wow, Katie. I don't, have you ever done I that would before? I would shred it if I had written it, put it in a drawer, taken it out a few weeks later. Wow. I'd be saying, ah, I need to, I need to strip this right back. I just yeah. said before, and what I mean is drawing board, but yeah. I haven't got a drawing board option on the menu list. Yeah, 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 that's right. Okay, so well, let's try and end on a positive note here. So what you're saying is you see the potential and you want Rob to get right up there. Is that right? Or do you just he not like it at all? I think it's a... Uh, I think at the moment it's a holy mess. Okay. All right. All right. Fair enough. Well, I don't think you've ever shredded anything before, have you? I'd rather not. Yeah. Wow. Well, gosh. Well, it's a historic evening tonight, everyone. You've seen Katie get her talons. And my God, 
When Katie's towels come out, they get shredding, that's for sure. Um, wow. So, look, let me, I, what I need to do now is to tell you what we've seen. Um, and let's start uh, from the bottom upwards. That was from Rob. Wizards and Whiskey. Uh, order the lager. And, yeah, we just saw something that we may never see again, guys, actually. And I hope not to, but there we go. The shredding was, was efficient. It happened. And it was... Over in a trice. Uh, from George, we saw a Ghetto State of Mind. That was his autobiography. Urban Drama. I thought very strong voice there. From Mark, we had Royken Horror, which we wanted to like a lot, but we didn't quite. And from Sarah, we had Dogs of Doom. And from Jeff, right at the beginning, we had The Peacemakers, which was Urban Fantasy. Now, uh, the very last thing we've got to do is to pick the submission we like the most. Uh, from today's show. So, guys, you need to start thinking quite quite carefully about that. In the chat room, too, please express a view. I will show you now. Let's go back to the live vote and let's do a little bit of refreshing. And we've refreshed it. That's how it looks, and it has changed a bit. So, we've got Wizards and Whiskey. There are those people who are in favour of Wizards and Whiskey. Oh, yes, they are. The same number of people, actually, who like a ghetto state of mind. So we've got we've got scores for both of those. The Peacemakers has got 25% of the vote, but still coming out in the lead, Dogs of Doom, 50%. So that's that's pretty, pretty unanimous, actually. Uh, Katie, which one did you go for? It's going to be difficult this week, isn't it? Yeah, I know. I'm going to be. I'm going to be in such a doghouse with uh -oh. everybody, um, uh -oh. because I think for me this evening, for voice and delivery and execution, yeah. reservations notwithstanding, yeah. my number one would be the peacemakers. Okay, okay, that's interesting. I didn't expect that for a moment, but Kate is nothing if not unexpected. Not predictable as our Katie, but then neither is Icy. What are you going to go for? <laughs> oh God! I mean, they've all they've all had things about them that I liked. Yeah. Um, oh, it's um, diffi it's difficult I'm tonight. Probably, I'm kind of torn between the first two, and I think yeah. the second one might might possibly be the nostalgia trip. Whereas Dogs the of first Doom. one, I could yeah, I could kind of see the peacemaker sort of almost like American Psycho gone wrong. So, it, or like, you yeah. could do that gone right. But you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. a, there was definitely, like, a, a weird Bateman feel to that one. So I also yeah, there like is. that one as well. There is, yeah, that's right. Whoa, okay, so you, what you're saying is you like them all. That's not good at all. <laughs> oh, okay, if I had to pick, I would probably, um, probably pick the Peacemakers as well. The Peacemakers as well. Mm. Wow. So we've actually got some collusion between you two, haven't we? All right, Katie, um, Peacemakers, I see, Peacemakers. The, um, the, uh, the vote is showing the Peacemakers 25%, Dogs are doing 50%. You know what, guys, it's up to me now, isn't it, really? <clears throat> Which one am I going to go for? I think it's, 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 it's an unusual week, this. I, it, quite often it's very clear. It's very clear last week. This week... I don't know. Peacemakers, yes. Dogs of Doom. I don't know. I think there's a feeling about Dogs of Doom that I like. Which one would I read more of? I would read more of Dogs of Doom than the Peacemakers. Because it feels like familiar territory to me. And of the two, I think I could probably pitch that rather more successfully than I could pitch the Peacemakers. And remember, that's the angle I come, I come from. So, it looks like I'm going to be agreeing with the popular vote today. That is... Well done. Yes, well done. Well done. Congratulations, Sarah. That was a tough one tonight, actually. Extremely difficult. Uh, guys, don't forget, please, that we've got our huddle coming up um, next Saturday. Very much looking forward to it. Second one. 
uh, kicks off, well, you can join from 4.30 onwards, but it officially kicks off at, uh, at 5 o'clock. Um, if you are a patron, then you can book in a few minutes' time. And if you're not, then you should be a patron, please, if you want Latopia to keep going. Um, but if you're not a patron, then you'll be able to book in the next day or two. So... <laughs> Conclude this evening's entertainment.